Well, traditionally, you know, there's uh, some videos that kids put together because they have a different perspective sometimes of the holidays. And I want to share this one with you. This is Easter According to Kids by Southland Christian Church. And so little ones, look at this. <laughs> After Jesus died, they put Jesus in a tomb. They wrapped him with some white paper. They put a big stone around it and placed guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda and eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland and then have a party by himself. <laughs> the Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> he probably went out there and did just throw eggs everywhere, and then he's gonna say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. <laughs> Three days later, there was a big earthquake. <laughs> I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like, I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking, run for your lives. <laughs> and the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, Don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the go tell every go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has rising from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No, that couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came, just was there. I am Jesus. I am the I'm the I am the son of the Lord God and I am Jesus your friend and then the disciples said Jesus it's you yay Jesus is alive totes cool Jesus before he left to heaven he said I have done what I have came to done <laughs> And then he risen, and he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, holy guacamole. I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome. Now what? Let's go tell the news. I think those are so cute. I just had to share that with you. The title of today's message is, Christ has risen. Now what? Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for this awesome day you've given us, and we do adore you. We thank you, Lord, that you know, are no longer in the grave. We thank you, Lord, that you rose, and we rose with you. And we just want to give you glory this day in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared that because something really struck me. If you remember the end of it, the little boy said, now what? So today's Easter Sunday. How many times have you heard folks, whether young or old, tell the story of the resurrection, sometimes accurately, sometimes like those kids? But now what? Now what? I saw this, and this says, yes, Christ is risen, but that's only half the story. The other half is that we must rise too. Now, taking it for face value is we must rise too one day with him, amen? But I want to challenge you today. Let's rise in our perception, not only of who Christ is, but who we are in Christ. See, Dr. John laid an awesome foundation last week, talking about not clinging to him. And we were singing earlier about glorifying God. And you know what? One of the greatest ways we can glorify him is to be him, is to reflect him. This morning, when uh, Elder Veronica opened up, she talked about love. Well, let's look at this. God is love. When we take a permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. 
This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're worry-free on Judgment Day. Look at the next part. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. Say that with me. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one not yet fully formed in love. Judgment. We think of judgment like we're going to get judged. But you know what? Francois Dutrois shared the word judgment in the Greek is crisis. And what does that sound like? Crisis. In the face of crisis, in the face of scrutiny, in the face of contradiction, opposition, challenge, or curveballs, as I shared a couple weeks ago. As he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. So while it's great to be looking for his coming, like Dr. John said last week, the angel said, or the guy said, why are you gazing up in the sky as he's going? We're supposed to be down here doing something. He said, occupy till I come, didn't he? Yes. The mirror said he's the firstborn from the same womb that reveals our genesis or our beginning. He confirms that we, we are the invention of God. We are born anew when he was raised from the dead. He res- his resurrection co-reveals our common genesis as well as our redeemed innocence. All mankind is redeemed. All mankind is innocent. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning, it says in Romans. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We look around this room. You on live stream are sons and daughters now of the most high God. We are. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. With himself. No condemnation, no shame, no judgment, okay? And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. Why, saints? Because as Dr. John said last week, Jesus first came to be an example of us. Not only for us. It's great to say, I'm going to do it because Jesus did it. What would Jesus do? But what is Jesus doing in us? What is he doing among us? What is he leading us to do? 1 John 3, 2 says, now are we the children of God. Now are we. Beloved, we know that we are the children of God to begin with, which means that there can be no future surprises. Isn't that neat? We are the children of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are the child of God. His manifest likeness is already, you mean right now? Yes, already mirrored in us, already right now. As in heaven, so on earth. There's just a working out on the side of heaven. That's all it is, saints. That's all it is. And that's probably why God said no, no man after the flesh but know him him after the spirit. Because if I see you perfect in Christ, I'm going to treat you as such. I'm not going to get on your case for when I don't think you've arrived, and you're not going to get on my case, amen? Amen. Our sameness cannot, say cannot. cannot. It cannot be compromised or contradicted. Our gaze will confirm exactly who he is and who we are. Wow. So with all that being said, let me just recap here. We live in God, and God lives in us. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. The Son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. His resurrection co-reveals our common genesis as well as our redeemed innocence. I love that. Redeemed innocence. That's the good news. We know, and I don't mean head knowledge, I'm talking about heart knowledge. I'm talking about perceiving. I'm talking about seeing. We know that we are the children of God to begin with. We know that we are the children of God to begin with right now, saints. His manifest likeness is already mirrored in us. Our sameness cannot be compromised or contradicted. This would be a good place to go ahead and take a screenshot. Sometimes tell yourself that every day. Speak to yourself and say, I live in God and God lives in me. My standing in the world is identical with Christ. The sun stands first in the line of humanity he restored, and I'm part of that. His resurrection co-revealed my common genesis as well as my redeemed innocence. I know that I'm a child of God to begin with. His manifest likeness is already mirrored in me. And really believe that. My sameness can't be compromised or contradicted. 
You see, saints, we are carriers of his message, filled with his love and anointed for purpose. He spoke that clearly to me the other day. We are carriers of his message, filled with his love and anointed for purpose. We are his ambassadors, his agents of life, his agents of love, his agents of healing, and greater work shall we do. It was necessary for him to go to the Father because greater work shall we do. Last week, Dr. John said it's a proclamation of a restored reality and identity that we are his likeness and we have no excuses. Some say it doesn't matter what we think about ourselves. I think it really does. So what do we think about ourselves? You see, God's view of us doesn't change. But when we see who we are and the reality of how God sees us, we can fulfill God's heart and be the answer to the question, now what? So now what? Christ is risen. Now what? Be a carrier of his message and go tell the good news of the gospel to everybody you meet. All humanity was born anew when Christ was raised from the dead. Can you say that with me? All humanity, all humanity, all humanity. His resurrection co-reveals our common genesis as well as our redeemed innocence. John 14, the person who trusts me will not only do what I'm going to do, but even greater things because I'm on my way to the Father. That's what Jesus told us. And he says, I'm giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. Sometimes we don't know why we're here. Why am I here? Why am I here? We're here to do the same work God did. Simple as that. Now, we have different realms that we're going to be doing it in. Someone's a banker, someone's a nurse, someone's a doctor, someone's a preacher, someone's a sound tech, someone's a grocery clerk. It doesn't make any difference. But in those areas, every person you meet, you're here to do that greater work. And he says, from now on, whatever you request along the lines of who I am and what I'm doing, I'll do it. Do we have confidence, saints, today that God's really going to flow through us and do what he said? Yes. When the challenges come. When the curveballs come, when everything comes, do we really have confidence he's going to do what he's going to do through us? There is no other option, right? I know a couple of you are here by faith. I have one young woman in our congregation who was in an emergency room earlier, and she's here today. So praise God. Some of y'all went through almost death's door. Here you are. So. But it's not even just for us, but on behalf of someone else. If God speaks to your heart and you feel a tugging to go pray for someone, can you pray for someone and lay hands on them? Can you be Jesus to them? I was with uh, Elder Wendy the other day, and I, um, we were at the store, and she said, can you stop for a second? And she grabbed some money, and I grabbed some money, and we gave to someone. We made a difference in someone's life. Why? Because we felt the tugging. But what if we didn't? What if we hadn't listened to that? Okay? He said, that's how the Father will be seen for who he is in the Son. I mean it. Whatever you request, I'll do it. And the mirror says it this way, because sometimes we think it's just about me, I, 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 I. The works that the believer will do will be of greater proportion and of global influence. Why? Because there's more of us now. There's more of us now. He was the first son, and we are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. He was the anointed king, and the Bible says we are now kings and priests. And see, a lot of times we feel like, oh, I can't say that. That's so egoistic. No. If we really want to glorify God besides just singing, which is awesome, let's glorify him through the works that he calls us to do and to touch lives. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do. Remember Dr. John's, what he was saying last week. Christ doesn't want us just gazing into the heavens after him. He desires us to reveal him and do his work in this realm. We're here for a reason, saints. We wake up every day and we say life is a gift. When people see us, they should be seeing the heart of the Father just like they did when they looked on Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you think Peter and John says, hey, look on us when they were at the gate, beautiful. Look on us. It wasn't about who they were in their own humanity. It was the fact that they knew who they were in the deity of Christ, who he is inside of them. And in 1 John chapter 14, 15, read it sometime, encourage yourself. He goes on and he tells his apostles that they have his spirit, they have his peace, they can stand strong, that his words find voice in us. That's the mirror, I love that. God's words find voice in you and me today, saints. And he also says to rest and abide in love. So now what? Be a carrier of his message. And the other thing is to do the works that Christ does. Jesus gave his disciples peace peace that passes understanding. And he told them not to be afraid. You're not alone. I've given you another comforter. 
You ask any little kid, they say, Jesus lives in my heart. And I say, let him out. Praise God. Let him out. We are anointed. We are equipped. And God's spirit is on you. To do what? Can we be so bold? And say this with me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to announce that captives shall be released and the blind shall see that the downtrodden shall be freed from their oppressors and that God is ready to give blessings to all to come to him. Are you ready to do that today? Yes, saints, Christ is risen, but that's only half the story. The other half is that we must rise too. Rise in our perception of how we see ourselves. Rise in the fact of who we are so we can minister life to a lost and dying world. You and I are anointed to preach the good news of the gospel to the poor, not to bring condemnation, but just to tell them how blessed they are and how much God loves them. He sent us to heal the brokenhearted. Anyone brokenhearted? Praise God. Maybe you in our midst, we need to minister life to one another, to announce to captives that they're free and blind, those who are in darkness. Instead of saying, oh, you sinner, just pull the shades back. Pull the shades back. That the downtrodden shall be freed from their oppressors. We're living in a time right now where people all around are feeling oppressed and downtrodden. You turn on the news and all you hear is about wars and you hear about fires and you hear about someone putting someone down or stealing or robbing or killing. We need to minister life to one another, saints. And that God is the blessing. God is our favorful Father. So I encourage you today, rise in your perception, not only of Christ, but of who you and I are in Christ. Be a carrier of his message, filled with his love and anointed for purpose. Be his agents of life and healing, filled with his spirit, doing the work that Christ does. Amen? Amen. Happy Resurrection Day, saints. Happy Resurrection Day, saints. Praise God. Hallelujah. And on that note, I'd love to have communion. So Dr. John, will you come on up? You on live stream, please join us. Thank you, Father. I wanted to keep it simple because we know earlier um, Elder Brian read the whole story. The little kids kind of got it right. But I want us just to rise in who we are in Christ today, man. Praise God. Wow. So much has happened in the last 24 hours for me um, and in this service. Um, when Pastor Karen asked me to do communion, you know, I'm, I'm like, it's after a while, it can become so ritualistic, even though it's so lovely. Uh, so I, my heart was, okay, God, what other little slant, what other little something I can bring to this, especially on this day where we remember the resurrection. I want to go back to one thing that Brian said that I thought was uh, quite good, and I uh, just want to remind you, when, when he was saying about this not being a myth, that this really happened, understand he wasn't, I think, uh, knowing Brian, he wasn't just addressing the fact that, well, you can mythologize this event. Understand something. Dying and rising gods existed for thousands of years before. Osiris, Mithras. You know, you go down a long list of from Egypt to uh, Phoenician to all kinds of Babylonian gods, uh, Ishtar and Tamuts, even in Rome. Have you ever heard of the Virginia Puritati? Virginia Puritati, at the time of Rome when Jesus was alive, was known as the pure virgin. So even the virgin birth concept existed before Jesus. The thing is, is while they were mythologies, Jesus put meat on it. And he didn't walk around basically saying, those are all false, I'm the real. Mm -hmm. Actually, what he did in certain respects, you could say, because you know, how, how many of you know um, the statement, your will be done on earth as in heaven? Yes. Yeah, great, great. You know what that also appears? Mm -hmm. On the opening door of the Temple Isis. You see, he wasn't about so much as saying, that's all wrong and I'm the true guy, they're wrong, I'm right. He was about saying, I'm the fulfillment of it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am it. Yeah. There were partial understandings here, kind of looking through that veil. But this is the real. And when we come to the, this moment, 
when Jesus is sitting at that table and he reaches for the bread and wine, I mean, there's two dynamic things that happen. First of all, it's happening in the middle of a Passover meal. And the second part is at this moment, he's, he harkens back to the Melchizedekian priesthood where Melchizedek brings to Abraham the bread and the wine. And something radical happens. Because the deliverance of the Egyptian people, I mean the deliverance of the Jewish people from Egypt didn't occur because they kept the rules. Matter of fact, the rules didn't even exist yet. They left in prosperity not because they did all the right things and God blessed them. They left blessed because God blesses. <laughs> so I wanted to read a little different scripture, if I can, for a change, though I promise I will quickly rehearse the 1 Corinthians 11.25 just for those of us who may uh, want to, to rehearse that again because we're told to and, and with good reason but not for the sake of just simply saying it by route so we can drink a cup and have a piece of bread, you know. First of all, the notion that eventually appears five, six hundred years ago that Jesus had to die to absorb God's wrath because of our sin, which we know is not true. Okay? But we've taught that. Matter of fact, I was just passed by something earlier, and it was Jesus had to die for your sin. Wow. I thought, hmm, really? Just out of curiosity, in Mark 2, how many of you remember when the paralytic came down? Mm -hmm. That's right. What does Jesus say? totally upsets the Pharisees. Yeah. He says, quote, son, your sins are forgiven you. That's right. mm -hmm. Well, who died to forgive his sins? Because <laughs> God forgives. Yeah. It's not the first time. In Luke 7, mm -hmm. woman with the alabaster box. Yeah. <laughs> he says to this woman, he says, your sins are forgiven you. And that got folks really upset. Who is this who even forgives sins? Well, he's, he's God, and that's what he does. <laughs> he just does that. Now, last little moment. In John chapter 1, Jesus is called the Lamb of God, most translation says who takes away. It literally means to lift the sins of the world. Now there's something interesting that happens there. Do you realize when John the Baptist said that, he was slapping the Pharisees literally? Because to the Pharisee or to the Jew, the lamb never represented forgiveness. Let me read to you. Matter of fact, I will show you. I actually took a picture of this earlier just to make a point. I'm not going to put it up there for the sake of time, but you can probably see this. It says, what does that say? Yeah. Jesus is not our Passover lamb. Wow. Okay. Why? Let me read to you what the rabbi says here. I won't mention his name because I'm not really against what he's saying. I agree with him. He says, the, in Exodus, the children of Israel, from their long bondage of Egypt of 3,300 3, years ago, was preceded by ten awesome plagues. The tenth plague was the death angel. The slaying of the Egyptian firstborn was the last plague. God instructed the Israelites to place the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and lintels of their houses, and the death angel passed over and when he saw this mark, when he went about smiting the Egyptians firstborn, he would not enter that house. The Passover lamb became a yearly sacrifice eaten on the first day of the holiday to commemorate this event. It was not sacrificed to atone for anyone's sins. 
See, we added that several hundred years ago. You see, the, the, the Passover lamb represented Egyptian idolatry. You read that in any Jewish book that describes the Passover lamb. That's what it represented. So the notion of killing the lamb was for them saying, we deny this Egypt, Egyptian. It's known as the Pesach Mitzrayim in Hebrew. Okay, it's the killing of that which is idolatrous. So I want you to think of what it was in the mind of the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, Caiaphas, when he condemns Jesus. See, Jesus was a problem, and he said so. The thing is with Jesus is he becomes two things, not just the one, and sometimes we confuse the two. The Patach Mitzrayim and what we call the scapegoat. Now the scapegoat had the sins put on him and then was let out outside of the city to be devoured. Whew, what am I saying? Why am I saying all this? Because there's something dynamic and powerful that happens here at this moment at the table when Jesus identifies himself with that cup and that bread, identifies himself with the liberation of a people group from a bondage. And the key bondage Jesus is about to liberate everybody from is religious bondage. And with it, as Brian pointed out, a political bondage. Again, as I said to you a week or two ago, he did not die. I mean, he did not. The people, uh, uh, the, the Christians of the day in Roman times didn't die because they believed in another god. Welcome to the group for all the gods they had. It was because kingdom was a different king. You know, Jesus was not trying to um, just simply have our religion become part of another nation. Actually, the kingdom is another nation. So as we go to the table, I want you to consider something. At that moment, think of all those years in Egyptian bondage. The word Egypt, Mitzrayim, means to be imprisoned. It means to be in bondage, to be enslaved, to be captive. That's Mitzrayim, Egypt, the word Egypt. And all of a sudden, we come to this moment where God reaches into the picture with Moshe, which means to be drawn out. Reaches into the picture and Jim simply says, it's time for you to be free. It's time for you to be free from this entire system. And at that point, before there's any rules, any temples, any priesthoods, the only priesthood that was, was the Melchizedekian one. And on that authority, he liberates the people. And the way he does it really is through, actually, because these, let me put it this way, if you go back and reread your Bible, these plagues were coming. Not because God sat up there and said, okay, I'm done, I'm going to start sending plagues. These plagues were going to come to Egypt because it was a reaping of what they sowed. Understand that. It wasn't that God got ticked off and said, okay, enough's enough. Here comes number one. It's the issue of this was a reaping of what they sowed, and that last plague would have also, and because, you know, <laughs> it also would have wiped out the other firstborn, because there was another firstborn there. You know, several times we read the pe where it says, Moses says, let my people go. But there's one point he says, let my son go. And because Pharaoh, who had the golden opportunity to be like God for a moment and release, free, liberate, chose not to. He sealed his doom 
because that plague was coming. But when it was coming, as many times it is, it hits everybody. So God devised a way under the Melchizedek priesthood to seal the fact that people would not all die. Amen. Well, guess what, folks? Jesus is of that order. And he goes right to this moment and the Passover meal. He reaches over, takes the bread and the wine. Because the next step for the children of Israel is they go to Sinai where the law is given and they reject God. The law is a representation of rejection, not a representation of purpose. Go back and reread those verses. What winds up happening next is Jesus also is going to go on the mountain, and that law is going to kill him. And that priesthood is going to kill him. And that temple is going to affirm that. And all that's going to come to an end. Law, priesthood, and temple. Done. Liberated from bondage once again. This is the symbol of our liberation. Not of another bondage to be in, uh, enveloped into. Let me read to you now real quick that segment of scripture. And what I'm going to do, because I usually read from the mirror or the King James. And why did my... There it is. Um, I'm going to actually use uh, the message, if I may, for a second. And understand, he's bringing at this, to telling us to be reminded of doing this because just verses prior, 20, just four verses prior, th prior to that, he says, I find that you bring your divisions into your worship. So really, this was to correct and solidify, quit being, quit killing each other. With right worship, wrong worship. This is holy, that's holy. This is not holy. This is unholy. This is, you know, last night I did the stupidest thing. I don't even know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And my, and so the reason for it, about two years ago, you know, two or three years ago, a movie came out called The Greatest Showman. Okay. Well, I resisted seeing it for quite some time because of something somebody said about it. And not that I necessarily believed it, but it kind of tainted my point of view. And I just suggested, like, okay, i just leave it alone. So then finally my, my daughter, about uh, two weeks ago, said, here's, uh, here's the greatest showman. You need to see this. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. And I told her what had happened. And she's like, don't let that bother you. Just get past it. Okay, fine. So I started my day yesterday, which is kind of the Wagnerian traditional thing, as I listened to Parsifal as I did my work twice through. That's eight hours of listening wow. in the background or when you, when you toll it up together. So then I finally rest. I ran errands, did stuff for Easter, da-da-da-da-da. Okay, and I, I decided, you know what, before I go to bed, because my daughter asked if I would bring back the DVD that she left at the house. It's been sitting there for two, year, two weeks. Would you bring it back tomorrow? I want to see the movie again. So I figured, okay, let me put this on. I'm coming to, the, I'm coming to Passover here in just a second. I'm coming to this here for in just a minute in light of what I'm saying. I promise. But I got to give you my story. So I decided, well, first I put on Interstellar. I don't want to stimulate my mind a little bit. Then I go, no, I better do this. <sighs> can I have a late night snack? I'm going to do this. I'll put on The Greatest Showman just so I can tell my daughter I saw it. I put it in. It wrecked me. And it wasn't the movie ultimately that wrecked me. It was the next two hours of watching all the behind the scenes stuff. That had me boohooing for God knows how long. And the thing that struck me the most for me about that movie was the freak show. The bearded lady, dog faced boy. And I thought, that's Jesus and us. We're the bearded lady, we're the dog faced boy, we're all that stuff. And he's put us on display. And I realized the folks on the outside that made fun of them said they're crazy and they're freaks are the religious folks. I thought, wow. So now I couldn't go to bed. <laughs> 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, it's like, I have to go to bed now. 
So finally I went to bed and then I got up and I had already thought about this communion thing and I already began to think about this and think about what we have superimposed on this liberty. And this is my point, I guess, ultimately. What Jesus did for us, you know, he's not trying to shave bearded ladies. But he's trying to shine through them. He's not trying to cut the hair off a dog boy or make the midget five foot seven because that's, a, that's maybe the appropriate height. But he wants to live through that. Where are you in your life right now? Where is he trying to? And I began to go through things in my mind. And I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but we've got the bleeding lady here. That for, there was a point, literally, blood was coming through her, her pores, her tongue. Right? Yeah, no, she's actually in the room right now. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I just want you to hear the point. You know what? And Jesus had to shine through her during that time. It happened more than once. And Lord willing, it never happened again. Then we got the one-legged lady. No, no, hear me out. You see, in the perfect religious world, say, oh, no, can't have that. No, then Jesus is, gonna sh is shining through that. Then we can start going down the list of all our stuff. And, you know, rather than Jesus wanting to change it, he wants to shine through it. He wants to reveal himself in it. Because I tell you, there's some things that we can go through that the religious mind says, no, you can't go through it. But when you go through it, when you, and it's not always, oh, I'm going to come out the other side. Coming out the other side is the revelation of Jesus, not necessarily you get your leg back. Not necessarily you don't have to be concerned about bleeding again. Not necessarily, we can start going down the list. Not just necessarily that you won't have a, a breakdown. Not necessarily that, you know, you walk on water. I'm probably more like Peter. I sink. And you've heard me say before, Peter couldn't walk on water whether it was a stormy day or a calm day out there. It's, let's not miss the point. He's risen. Now what? Now what? We can venerate this day and be stuck at the tomb. Or we can become the resurrected Christ. As we partake of this today. Let all our religious idolatry die for a moment in Christ. The scapegoat's taken the sin. It's finished. Get rid of the sin consciousness. I have one person after the message I shared last week say to me, you know, um, I always go to the cross. The cross is very important to me. I always go there when I sin. And I'm thinking to myself, we missed the point then. Yeah. The scripture says in Hebrews that what that did was remove a consciousness of sin. So if I keep, if I sin and I got to go back to the cross, I maybe missed the point of the cross. So well, what if I make a mistake? A, welcome to the group. B, that's part of your journey now. It's part of Christ living through us. It's a crazy thing. We keep trying to be perfect, and God's trying to live through imperfection. So Paul says, message version, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper. <laughs> Why it's so centrally important. I received instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, having given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he said the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. That you must solemnly realize that each time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you enact the words and actions that, and, the, and, actions that, and the actions of the death of the Master. You'll be drawn back to this meal again and again until the Master returns, but you must never let familiarity breed contempt. 
Anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Well, who was in the crowd? It wasn't just the Romans sitting over there, those pagans. It was the high religious people of the day. Say again, Brian. The church people. <laughs> no. <sighs> what an awesomeness. Let's take our religious idolatries and leave it on the cross. Let's take our sin consciousness of breaking rules, leave it on the cross. Let's be the bearded lady, the bleeding lady, the one-legged lady, whatever lady. How about a guy... I don't even know, just us guys alone are, that's enough right there. Ask my wife. She'll say to me sometimes, you're such a guy. Do you hear that too, Brian, or is it just me? <laughs> oh, thanks. Are you with me? Thank you. Oh, Jesus. Well, I know we have family and things to go to, but I just... In light of Pastor Karen's message, Brian, I didn't, was, I didn't get here when Veronica shared, but it once again, ties. it all ties, this love thing. <sighs> no effort on your part. You don't have to do anything to allow him to shine through you. But I promise you, when he's shining, you won't be able to help yourself and do amazing things. And doing amazing things. It's like one person said to me, and I wrote it in my Melchizedek book toward the end. I said, you, you, they said, well, so what you're saying then, I, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to pray. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to do any of those things. And you know what? You're absolutely right. You don't have to do any of those things. Right. You mean I don't have to? No. You know, you mean, I can just let Jesus shine through me. I don't have to do any of those things. I said, yeah, but you run into a problem. You see, Jesus shining through you. Jesus doesn't go to church. He started one. How committed are you to Jesus shining right. through you? <laughs> <laughs> You see, Jesus didn't tie, he gave his life. How committed are you to having Jesus shine through you? Because you can't sit on the couch and say, I'm letting Jesus shine and not go to church and not pray and not do those things. Why? Because if Jesus is shining, I'm building church, I'm empowering people, I'm giving of my life, time, talent, and tithe and everything else to further that understanding. Okay, John, shut up. You're preaching now. Father... I thank you, Lord, for this cup. Thank you, Lord. We are reminded of all that that death possessed, both lamb and scapegoat, is undone in the resurrection. And as we partake, this is our death. And as we walk out that door, we are the resurrected Christ right now, Amen. completely. With all our imperfections to a religious world, and maybe all our stupidity to a secular one, we are still a revelation of Christ going somewhere to happen. If I can bother you for a moment. Um, let's see what we're going to do today. B, you did such a thing. She then she wrecked me with holy that yeah. song. Oh God, I've been like crying for like ten hours now, between <laughs> Greatest Showman. Yeah. I, I get here and thinking, okay, I'm gonna hear B. I'm really excited about this. And she hits that song, and I, yeah. I'm lost. Yeah. <sighs> come over here, B. Help me out with this, huh? Yeah. Jerry, why don't you come up here, pal? Yeah, yeah, yeah Jerry. I want you to grab one of the elements. B, choose whichever you wish. You wish. The cup, if you wish. Our tradition, and I use that word strongly, our tradition here is that what we do is we break the matzah up and we then dip it in the cup and you, you partake that way. Um, that's just how we've done it. Drinking from the cup or in some places you don't drink anything at all. You have a little thing. It all works to me as long as if our heart's right and in the right, right spot. That's right. But that's just how we do it. That's yeah. we do. Okay. So be if you would be so kind. Wow, that's. <laughs> it's not my ankles, I promise. 
makes me think of uh, the Nutty Professor, the original one with Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Do you remember that scene? He's walking down the corridor. He's a little uh, late, and his feet are making that sound, his shoes. He takes off his shoes, and he keeps walking. It still makes the same sound. It was his socks, you know. Lord, you're broken. And each of us are a piece of that shattered vessel. And as we see each of us a member of the whole, we reunite the Christ. Lord, your blood was shed. The life was shed. And our taking of that is the fact that now we are your life yes. and you are ours so as you contemplate that and come some of you have may have heard that you know check your heart to see if there's any sin you don't take unworthily i want you to understand something no it's actually the opposite check your heart and make sure that you see yourself the way god created you this is not nitroglycerin or arsenic, that if you drink it or handle it improperly, you're going to die. <laughs> Actually, when we don't understand the beauty of this, that's why we, we still live in death, really. Would you all come, please? Sir Buster, if there's any music. Or, oh, you got it already. Okay, great. Thank you. Would you come, please? a king, a risen king, radiant, he reigns in majesty, he conquered death, it has no sting. For those of you watching on live stream, I just wanted to ask you to celebrate today. His resurrection is your resurrection. His resurrection is your new day. And for that matter, every day is a new day in Christ. Yesterday's past. Last minute is past. You get to create a brand new moment in just a couple of seconds with Christ. Every day even if you're a bearded lady. So I'm gonna encourage you live stream. Celebrate today, celebrate it every day. If you have any questions or thoughts, comments, do. Do write us, we do respond. Love you. Have a wonderful resurrection day.